Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. How Great are to be, you? Great to be here. Thanks, Good. Nadim. Thanks for being here. Yeah, Excited. We got uh, Andre here, back for his uh, second or third? Second. Second episode. Andre, our president of Gojek. And we got Thomas Husted. This is your first time? First time. Happy to be here. All right. You're a Go Figure uh, first timer. Yes. Well done. Well done. Thank you thank for you, being here. You. Thomas Husted is our CFO yep. and runs all things uh, related to money in the organization. Uh, so together, Tom and Andre uh, run the entire fundraise and spending strategy and spending control of the company. And today the topic is something uh, <laughs> that is that is very, very uh, interesting. It is about raising billions of dollars. Raising billions. US dollar. Yes. <laughs> Let's just make sure. <laughs> We're talking about U.S. dollars, US dollars. Yeah. raising billions of U.S. dollars in a company. What are, how do you do it? What are the pitfalls and what are the advantages? I'm looking forward to a lot of good analogies from Andre during this session. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about how, how, how you do it too. How, how do we end up being able to be put in the position to be able to raise billions of dollars? How do you even get there? Uh, I can start. Well, I, I think you know, there's a lot of probably ways to answer it, but it all starts with the simplest stuff, whether you have a product that really sells, right? So it's all about the, the essence of the why people wants to invest, right? And that's actually, people always generally forget that when you know, a country or a region becomes overcapitalized, it's so easy to just hey, I can raise more money. I can, I can draw a concept and then just raise ten million dollars. That might be true, in a very bullish uh, environment. But that people always forget that in essence, you are here because of the why, which is the product that really sells. Right, starts with that. Right, I mean, mm -hmm. and that's also why I think, in essence, the CEO or founder or co-founding team needs to be the one who really drives the um, the storytelling. Right? Because those are the people who really built the original idea and have the mission and the purpose of the why. And sometimes when you send, you know, apologies, you know, bankers to sell that story to you, everything is diluted. So and fundraising is, a, is about building relationship. It's a relationship management. I, I like that yeah. word you use about storytelling. Yeah, storytelling. Um, a lot of people assume that when, 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 whenever I tell them that fundraising is about the story, you know, they often get confused because it's, it's as if like we're creating a fictional <laughs> imagination, like a fairy tale mm -hmm. uh, with which to raise money. But in reality, you know, a pitch, like any other pitch, it is about the conviction of the future and the promise that you are making, which is a story. Yes. That's just, and that story has to make sense from a performance perspective, but it also has to be inspiring. That's right. And confidence building. Yeah, and I think that's right. And also, you know, there's an evolution to that process, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I'm, you know, we've known each other for quite some time. Andre and I have worked together for the better part of 10 years. We've known each other for a long time as mm -hmm. well. And I remember, um, you know, when I was first hearing about the Gojek story, and ju just in context, you know, I joined the company 18 months ago. So before that, you know, looking from the outside, it was all kind of a bit of a mystery <laughs> how, how it was done, right? And the, and the, and the various evolutions of the product. And I remember speaking, I think it was with both of you, very early in the process where you were kind of constantly joking that the idea was, let's start this ride hailing app and then, you know, sell it to Uber kind of, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like five, ten months later for, you know, some very nice sum of money. And then from, you know, again, from an external observer looking in, what I saw was that you eventually saw multiple avenues to grow the business. Yeah. And then ultimately that story 
corresponded with what Andre just mentioned, which was kind of the belief of the founders and thinking about how you could grow the business. Mm -hmm. And then that immediately morphed into, I think, Andre joining the company and then, oh, you know, the, the fundraising then started thereafter yeah. in earnest. There's no way we're going to be any close to raising billions if the story was about, oh, I'm going to make a ride-hailing app. Very quickly, it transformed. The story transformed into how do we fundamentally transform how mobility works for humans, for stuff, mm -hmm. and for value or money, right? And now the story of Gojek, and we've proven that through our products and our execution is that we are a full stack mobility platform. We move humans, we move things, and we move money yep. around. Yep. Um, and that story was what made the addressable market, and, and our numbers obviously, <laughs> have to back it up by our numbers, w which was made the addressable market so big. You know, like the product vision of Gojek is, you know, all transactions, you know, like one single mm -hmm. app. Yep. Uh, it's such a powerful and compelling story that is achievable in a region as big as Southeast Asia uh, that that I think that and the confidence of our team um, compelled a lot of people to think this is this is the one of the best destinations for capital. If you remember um, for our series A, the model says that we need fifty million to be break even. So if that was true, in this podcast is <laughs> 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 never going to happen. <laughs> so, so just, you know. We keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and the, the products have an evolutionary life cycle, right, where it actually requires incremental capital to continue to grow yep. and add on. Yeah. And, that, and that, that, you know, frankly, from my perspective, having just joined the company 18 months ago, that's what makes life really interesting here, right? You wake mm -hmm. up, you come into the job every day, and it's new and fresh and, uh, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you do the fundraising, which Andrew is principally leading? And then how do you control, you know, the messaging? But that's the thing, right? We always like, we always think, okay, can it really get that much bigger, right? Every year we have that same self-doubt in a management <laughs> team, like it's already really big. Like how can it get so big? It keeps going, it keeps going. And I think that's when you know, back to Andre's point, that's when you know when you've solved a massive problem and people don't go back to the old way of doing things, uh, that you know you're attacking fundamental efficiencies in the market that are being created. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're no longer in market disruption mode, we are in market creation mode. Right. We have been for the past two and a half years. So if you, like I, I can think of very, very few companies in the world that have raised billions that are not market creation companies, mm -hmm. right? Like it's Complete almost- disruption. Yeah, yeah. It, not even, dis because disruption implies that you you uh, you took over yep. an, an old way of doing things, but literally all of our markets did not exist at this scale, That's right. even in any substitute. There was simply not enough food, there was a fraction of what food delivery transactions are done now. There's a fraction of what vehicle-based transportation, not even ride hailing, right? Like the amount of things that you could take a, pro a vehicle for transport, like taxi, for example, before, now the market's like, yep. whatever. 20, 30, 40 X of it. Yeah, and just to put that in context, so when, when I joined the company, this was yeah January last year, we were doing about 250,000 orders on food per day. And around like three to four months later, and the numbers had doubled already mm -hmm. three to four months later. And, and we had that was around the time that the Meituan IPO happened. And we sat down and talked to a bunch of bankers and looked at the numbers. And it was like kind of like all of a sudden that's when like, like light, the light bulb went on. Yeah. We're creating something totally new. Yeah. And as a result of that, we did a we looked at the capital allocation in the company and we had a relatively quick decision that we actually need to pour a lot more money into that. And I looked at the numbers this weekend, it's probably more like one point eight million right now, which is remarkable and it goes to this this theme of kind of creating a whole new business model. The ceiling keeps going yeah. higher and higher. And, and to be fair, um, we joke a lot in this that there's multiple evolution of the idea, and we weren't expecting. But at least you know, going back to mm -hmm. my my first comment about the why and the purpose, I think we've maintained consistency because there there were two purposes that you have created uh, at the beginning. One is to remove transport friction at the beginning mm. but now we're actually moving into we remove life's daily friction which is similar it's a, it's a problem statement that exists in this part of the world and the second part is to help the little guys right and we continuously adhere to that principle and the little guys are the one who's actually also you know exponentially 
you know, kind of, you know, um, proven to the to the whole world that we can do it as well. And our business really grows because of that principles as well, which is relating to a second point. You know, once you start with a purpose and why, then the second most important one as well is that is your uh, first is your um, the regional coverage of your business or your product really is going to grow in an exponential way, and then whether your product from a market positioning perspective is going to solve that problem and unlock the hundred x scaling uh, from where it is today, right? Because you know a great product, a great vision, subpar country or opportunity, unfortunately, doesn't also relate to. A you know, probability to be able to kind of raise multiple folds of money and stuff. And and I just want to you know, a lot. I, I want to remind I think listeners that are in the process of fundraising that there's only so much that you know your confidence and authenticity as a founding team when you pitch for money can only take you so far if you haven't shown traction, right? Traction is still one of the most important things to show that you are actually able to execute and consistently execute on what you have. So I don't want people to be thinking that, oh, if I just craft this beautiful imaginary story without backing it up by numbers, That's it right. isn't. And in our industry, um, it's much easier to do that. We're not like a you know free first and then monetize later uh, industry. Every person who uses, because we're a transactional platform, every person that uses us spends money. That's right. Right. Yeah. So for us, uh, monetization is just a function of you know ch charging a higher commission rate or reducing our promotional budget. Right. The the benefit of a company that requires their users to spend money on our platform is that uh, profitability is a choice depending on how much you want to sacrifice, say growth. market share mm -hmm. or growth. Yeah. Right. So that's a very important thing. There isn't ever a situation that we can never pull that trigger where okay we need to make money now. Um, so, so it actually gives a lot of confidence to investors. If your business model, you have full power over your monetization capabilities. Mm -hmm. So that even if you run out of money, all of a sudden you can you can still generate profit. Yeah. Right. Uh, even at a smaller that, scale. Yeah. <clears throat> having those levers internally is something that's really critical. Yeah. And and being able to actually demonstrate that you can do that. I mean, back back to the Go Food example. When we looked at that business just prior to the the Meituan IPO, we mm. actually started to 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 essentially optimize toward profitability. That's right. And it was way too early. And, and what we kind of what we what we realized was that we were building something where we were creating a market. Yeah. And that actually took much more time and effort. And I think you know with with all the parallels that we operate in, all the verticals that we operate in, one of the other issues is is actually scaling the talent as well. And this is something I've seen both of you do remarkably well over the last, really, I'd say last year, we've kind of put it into a different gear. Well, we you got know. you. No. <laughs> we no, did. Right, yeah. I, no, don't I, think, I don't think we would have gotten him if we didn't <laughs> raise billions. No, I, I would have been, you know, I, I, I missed my window of opportunity here. Trust, trust, trust me, I wish I had joined three years ago. No, but I was really more referring to like Kath and Hans, who I know have been on the podcast before, yeah. right, who are like really deep in the trenches and actually executing extremely well and that's that uh again it makes it just makes the, it makes it really interesting coming to work every day okay so let's go into the advantages wait park that thought actually the, mm -hmm. the, because the biggest advantage you're right the biggest advantage of raising big sums of money is people is talent yeah okay yep. and I'll, i want to go into that in a second i first just want to finish up about the art of the pitch slightly about getting the money itself right so we talked about numbers we talked about this now once you have product market fit, once you have a compelling vision and compelling numbers to back up what you want, usually you start raising at the billion number, what What are we talking about? Series D. Series D, mm -hmm. so it's gotta be your fifth or sixth round, yep. right? At least, right? Before you start um, thinking about numbers in this, in this magnitude. At that point, I believe that the the if I look at all of our pitches that we've done mm -hmm. and all of our sessions <clears throat> that we've done, the bigger your company gets, the more important and the more sophisticated investors get, the more important is your organizational vision. 
mm-hmm. and your culture vision for the organization. This is something that starts to shift. Before, it's all about just like, okay, did you gain traction? Are you going to be hitting your numbers? Oh, is the business model sound, et cetera. As you get bigger and bigger, you start attracting more and more sophisticated investors. And you start getting challenge on what are your organizational chops? What is the quality of your team? How do you think about target setting in your organizations? Mm-hmm. What are the cultural traits? Now at our fundraise level, uh, you know, investors are coming in talking to our leaders all yep. the time. They're like opening up the, the kitchen, if you will, and talking directly to our leaders asking about, are you, you happy living here? Uh, sorry, are you happy working here? Are, are, you, are you enjoying your leadership? Uh, uh, are you learning? And all these kind of things. So there, there's this shift towards organizational competence that I think becomes increasingly important for your next successful fundraise, mm-hmm. I think. And again, back to Tom's point, the other thing is showing that even if you are burning a lot of money, to show experiments whereby you can achieve break even if not profitable operations and mm-hmm. simple experiments that That's you right. can do to show, <clears throat> look, I know you want to know, the big question mark is under break even or positive unit economics, can we still maintain volumes? Here's the proof, right? That's a brilliant way of actually saying we can't not grow because we need to grow because there's so much bigger potential. Otherwise, we're missing out on all this growth. But check this out. We did this experiment here and we reach profitability without sacrificing too much volume. It's a great question. So let me ask both of you a question, which is, you know, series kind of A, B, C, how much of those fundraise, you know, were fundraisers were really led by you in your sole capacity oh. Re- relative to kind of where we are now, EF? Think of, well, to be fair, it's not just us, but it's a small group of people, right? Um, I think it was, I would say usually Series A to D, it's very uh, centralized, if you may. Mm-hmm. And then as we move on, and then obviously there's more and more kind of a deeper analysis on trends and you know business performance and stuff, then a lot of more people needs to chime in. Right, and then that to Nadeem's point, that, that's when the investors actually are required to come into the company and essentially meet the next layer down and gain confidence in all of those people. Yeah, because at this scale of a company, the the amount, the executive impact of the founding team starts to shrink, mm-hmm. right? The ability for for me to just to trust the founders in a company of this size is no longer, it's, it, you know, there are many more people that are responsible and are accountable for the outcome of the of the company at this level, it's almost more like a at at, at this stage of our company, it's almost like we're raising like a public round, you know, like it's that's almost right. like we're a public like company, <clears throat> yeah. Like but it's yeah. just not listed. And that, that's actually um, let me let me throw a, a bit of a contra, controversial mix to it, right? Because that in itself is the myth that every a lot of people externally think that hey, you know, if you're a good company, good brand. You know, you know, go to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's just a simple and, um, you know, really straightforward process. You know, if you get like a very big strategic shareholder, you'll get there anyway. But people always forget. And that's why always people always think about it as, hey, you know, the, fa- the co-founder or the CEO is enough. Those types of persona can actually do the job. You know, and then there's no strat. You know, there's not much strategy behind it because if there's money, there's always gonna be a fundraising you know, probability. But in reality, it's the furthest from the truth, right? And I think the complexity on thinking about the strategy, you know, in each level, and really thinking about long term. Okay, what's next? Because in in this company, whenever we fundraise, we're already fundraising for the next one. Always, mm-hmm. we're we're talking about this right now. But if you be able to raise X, that will give you into, uh, let's say, two or three years runway. Two, three years runway, you know, valuation is now X. You want to be raising at the valuation of Y. In the, in the next two to three years, what is the story next? And then whenever you do fundraise for now, you always build for what's next, right? So that's why I like to kind of, you know, kind of be, you know, 
give a framework of how to fundraise, I always kind of symbolize this, this with one of my favorite sport, if you may. If you may. Here it comes. <laughs> it, <laughs> is, it, is it Premier League reference having? No, it's it's called the World Series of Poker. Oh, uh, okay. so um, you know, for for a lot of people, you know, it's it seems like it's a gambling, you know, um, game. It's right? not. It's really not it's because not once you at all. once you're in and you once you know how how the game of poker is being run, yeah, it is the probably the, one of the most complex strategy. If you know, even if you play it, it's like chess. One table like this. It's yeah. already complex. Yeah. Imagine in a World Series of Poker, you have to go table by table in three or four days until you get to the final table. So that's the analogy. So you, in a, in a, in a poker game, you, uh, you have the, the shark or the one who always get aggressive and build their chip stack. And then there's also people who play very disciplined, very by the book. You know, if you get, you know, pocket aces, you'll go all in, but if you get Ace and ten, you fold, right? I mean, that's always there's always that by the book probability, and you count, right, uh, in terms of the uh, probabilistic number. The the sharks who always, you know, stacking the chip. In this context, is people over raising, over capitalizing, right? Mm. Has the right to bully others. So when they fight with, you know, a moderate player, the moderate player will always get fear. They might have a good hand. But given that it's always over race, over race, over race, you have this risk or uh, fear, and also your number of numbers wise, you're overwhelmed by the uh, probability that you will fold a good card, and your opportunity to kind of win becomes less and less because of a probabilistic number. So that's one mindset. There's also the disciplined player, right? Maintain consistency in this context. People who really build the product. To be long, long, long-term sustainable, right? The product is really good. You know, you don't want it to spend too much money. But again, you know, you probably ended up with lower chip stack. But you maintain discipline. You might be able to get the final table. And kid you not, I mean, the the guy who has the biggest chip stack when you go to the final table against the you know smaller chip stack, there's always opportunity for the lower chip stack to win. So it's you know, so there's two. Right, but then, but then there's the third one, which is what I call the guy who always inconsistently consistent, which is you be able to be a shark or a discipline at the right moment in the game. So no one can really predict what mm. you think. And so, so you, deploy, you deploy both strategies, both strategies depending on where you are in the game. Exactly. When there's a moment when you've when you uh, when you actually um, read some weaknesses, when you see some patterns, then you become a shark. When you see some patterns, the other ways, you become disciplined and you always play with your numbers, right? And that's actually where the the great, you know, separates from the good, right? And that's actually where consistency on opportunity and rewards and probabilistic number will always gear towards these guys, right? And to get here is very difficult, right? In the context of fundraising, then there's always that opportunity, okay? Because in reality, fundraising is not always about skills. It's also about the moment in time where you are, right? Mm. If the market is really bad, today we hear a lot of very bad news um, globally. Uh, what's happening in the world, you know, capital will dry up. but. The, the, the third guy, the inconsistently consistent, in moments of victory, in moments of defeat, they're always consistent mm. because they know how to play the game in both, both of the equation. Mm. And the consistency is really important. And it's just the same thing. If today capital market is dried up, you know, all public market, Uber, you know, stock price went down, everything is just went down, your comparables is terrible from a valuation multiple perspective, but you, you know you still need to raise. How do you do it, right? And that's actually where you know people needs to realize the the art of fundraising is super complex, and no one can be really good at it unless you already experience it, right? So and your adaptability and being able to see the pattern recognition, hear a lot of advices you know, speak to a lot of people and understand those patterns to be able to then 
really build that kind of long-term plan and how do you react with all the uh, curveballs that's thrown into you is the most important part of the success of this, right? I mean, that's, that's actually um, how I'm seeing it. I mean, you, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I admire about you the most, Dre, is, is, is your contingency planning skills, right? You are, by default, that hybrid player. Uh, in the fundraising <laughs> space. You are, you are, and, and I learn a lot from you about this. But you've noticed that in, in, in all of our fundraises, we build mechanics into our business that always assume that this will be the last fundraise. It never is. <laughs> it never is. You just but, say it. <laughs> but we, we built it in. Yep. We build the fail-safes that for, okay, if we can't ever raise money again, this is the plan, this is the thing, and we can do it. And we picture it out and we let all the management know this is all the plans that we are. I mean, we, we had this discussion just a couple of months ago about like, okay, where, where are our fail safes in the system, That's right? right? Yeah. Where are That's our fail right. safes? And, and always having that assumption in, in fundraising, the worst thing you can do is build a business predicated upon the next fundraise. The worst thing you can do is yes. you just didn't plan for if it doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. Correct. Correct. And can, can I just add, because yeah. I think this analogy is very good. Let me just add to that that specific point, because I think while Andre is focused on optimization, right, which is a critical skill, I think there's another cultural trait in the company. And frankly, I think it's it's also an, uh, somewhat of an Indonesian trait, which is part of the reason why I frankly really enjoy, enjoy working here. And that is when you step back and you think about the non-fundraising deal making that we do, which is also equally frenetic, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, all the time. That's and I an think, understatement. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you think about kind of traditional corporates globally, right, they tend to have high walls and deep moats, right? Yeah. They want to protect the capital structure. They want to protect their own upside. And one of the things that's so nice about working here is while we're optimizing on the fundraise and optionality, which is, you know, frankly, what shareholders want to see us doing, the approach is somewhat different when it comes to partnerships particularly in Indonesia, when we're thinking about adding to the overall platform. And I would use the analogy of it's kind of like a big tent. So the more people we have in the tent and, mm -hmm. the, and the more partnerships we have, the higher the likelihood for success. And it almost creates a virtual circle back to this optimization analogy that Andre just talked about, mm -hmm. which is you have more people pulling for you, you have more people pushing the agenda. And then when new investors come to look and say, hey, who are you and how do you work, you automatically have a massive bench of people basically saying, this is the right strategy, mm -hmm. this is the right team, and this is the right game plan going forward. It's so, like having secret partners in the poker table. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. Right? Which is illegal in poker, mm -hmm. but in business, it's absolutely it's a requirement, illegal. right? It's <laughs> a complete requirement. You need to have allies. Um, and, and, and in some cases, you're slightly competing with those allies, but in many cases, you're partnering with them as well. And Gojek Correct. simply can't survive without those partnerships. So yeah, that's our DNA. And then kind of when you overlay the poker strategy of actually raising lots of money and then thinking about building a big tent. So everybody that wants to come into the big tent and be part of the story knows you have all that money. That creates kind of a moral hazard in regards to how you negotiate a partnership transaction. Mm -hmm. And then the third component, which actually makes it also extremely difficult, is the fact that everybody knows that we are in a, you know, a pretty existential battle with one large competitor mm. that is equally well, well, well capitalized. Mm -hmm. So that the dynamic of like, okay, well, we want to do this with you, but we have another option on the table as well. Yeah. <laughs> that creates... Because they want to keep their options open as yeah. well, correct. right? Correct. So I mean, if you're, if you're somebody in Indonesia that has something that's of tremendous value to this platform, you are also going to optimize. Yeah. So then that also kind of goes back to the poker analogy and that that creates a very interesting dynamic and frankly we spend a tremendous amount of time in this building constantly talking about that and and mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong but i think the biggest you know reason why we end up winning those partnerships over ultimately don't don't come down to money i think the biggest reason of that is is usually trust and that's relationships right. yes. that's the that's the 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 referee the middle, right? Usually when there's like, an, oh my God, like yep. I'm closing one opportunity if I work with one partner, et cetera. At the end of the day, they're going to make a gut decision based on trust and relationship. 
right? Yeah. And that's usually where where we tend to win that partnership uh, in in many in many circumstances. Mm-hmm. But having a big pool of capital provides the leverage to make yourself very quickly very relevant to everybody. Co- yeah. Correct. And yeah. the, other, the one other thing I would point out mm-hmm. on this, though, it also requires a massive teamwork uh, effort. Uh, and secondly, none of these things happen quickly. Right. I mean, these these partnerships, in some cases, I mean, we've been working on a couple that have been going on for two years. Yeah. Right. Terms constantly change. And, and eventually you'll get to a point where, you know, there's either a fork in the road and you don't do it or you do it. But how you engage and how you treat those people is really everything. Ma- it really matters. Is everything. Because, Even if you never reach an agreement. Correct. That's what a lot of people don't. Correct. They don't teach you that in business school yep. at all. And this this is, I mean, look, as as the foreigner sitting at the table, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, you guys know I've spent a long time in Indonesia. I've lived and worked here for about 15 years. This You're is an my, honorary Indonesian. I'm, I'm the Indonesia. hybrid. So <laughs> You're uh, more Indonesian than we are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, your, your children are half Indonesian. Yes, so yes. There you go. Um, but uh, I think, you know, that engagement and the engagement in the local context of being humble, despite the idea you know, despite the reality that everybody knows you've got the big stack of chips mm-hmm. yeah. is actually really important, right? The big stack of chips, that analogy is important mostly in the fundraising context, particularly in optimization and figuring out how you get the best possible terms, which is what our existing shareholders want us to do all day long. Yeah, but that's how you build trust. Yeah. How else do you build trust unless you have demonstrated that you are not abusing your position of power and mm-hmm. your chip stack, right? That's right. That's how you build trust. Yep. Um, but I, you know, I think that what you mentioned before was really interesting. Like, it builds advantage in having partnerships want to come to you, but it builds moral hazard inside your organization with which to make clumsy, stupid mistakes, knowing that there's so much money. So we hear a lot um, of, of this talk in, in, in India, now in Southeast Asia, definitely in China as well about how raising billions is a curse as mm-hmm. much as it is a gift. So let's go a little bit about the curse. W- what are these pitfalls and risks? Sure. So I know, mean, we've gone through them, yeah. right? Let's be honest. We, we have. And, and, and to be <clears throat> frank, I mean, I think, look, my, my DNA is kind of a command and control CFO. I mean, my last two CFO roles. No, really? No. I, I, hadn't, I, didn't, I, did not, <laughs> I, had, I had not noticed. I, I've had, I've had <laughs> to retrain obvious. myself. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that, but that comes out Tom, of like, Tom is the, always the adult in the room. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, children. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's no. make sure we don't spend all this money. Okay, no. No, I think no, this but that's is, necessary. Right. So you look at me, the, the, the story, you know, my personal background, right? I grew up in Maine, right? Um, my, I came home one day. I was 16 years old. My parents, um, I came home. My parents said, hey, we're going to move to the Philippines because my dad had decided to take a job there. Yeah. So I went to high school in Manila and um, complete eye-opening like amazing experience, loved every second of it. And I came out of that and I thought, wow, I really like, this is it. I want to work internationally for my career. Mm. So then I went back to the U.S. college, graduate school, and was fortunate enough to get a job at Citibank. So where did they send me? They sent me to Indonesia in year 2000, immediately after the crisis. So the, the Asian financial crisis. So coming out of that, and I was in the debt restructuring team at Citi. So you were born in, no, the, I, in the fire of, of <laughs> rescue mission, right? No, so it was, it was a, you know, there, was a, there were a lot of lessons to observe during that time period, mm-hmm. both in terms of how you actually Just moderate. for the listeners that don't know, this is the period when we had a massive financial crisis in Indonesia and a huge swath of businesses had to shut down. That's right. Because of credit issues, et cetera. It's our currency went crashing down, et cetera. Correct. So just for listeners that don't know. Yeah, so, so it was a very formative time for me personally. But also looking back on it, the most interesting thing is that actually the investors that looked at that as an opportunity um, did extremely well. Mm. And, I'm, and I think we collectively are very fortunate that a lot of those investors that invested in Indonesia from you know, kind of circa, let's say, 2002 to 2006 are existing investors now. In Gojek. In Gojek. Yeah. And yeah. they are influential. They are thoughtful uh, and, and totally engaged. So that was the that was my personal background, and then then eventually I left banking and took and I've been a CFO in two other companies in Indonesia, both which required some restructuring work. One was a, a balance sheet restructuring, pretty pretty large, and the second was an operational restructuring. So when I showed up at Gojek, 
um, I, you know, it was, I kind of knew what to expect and uh, I loved the challenge. And the one thing I noticed immediately, which I think is probably the case for every fast growing tech company is that, you know, you do rounds A, B, C, all the money is focused on tech product and growth. Mm -hmm. And what, what is lacking is essentially everything that's going to require a company to eventually go to an IPO. So, mm. you know, systems, control, policies, procedures. Compliance. All, all, the, all the boring stuff that people don't want to talk about. <laughs> so, what is that? Why are you, why are you such a downer, Tom? <laughs> no, no, it's good. <laughs> so, and and, and I, look, this is, I'm, I'm, so what we did is, you know, Andre and I spoke a lot about this. We went out and, and hired a bunch of really good people. And yeah. we've, got a, we've got a fantastic team and they're working, you know, in close tandem with, with, uh, yeah. with the rest of the other, other groups. And it feels like we're kind of hitting our stride now. But how hard is that? Like preparing a company, a very young company of millennials, um, to go IPO and to institute processes. It's like it's like you know, it's like telling people at a party, you know, all right, guys, you know, like from now on, you know, <laughs> I'm we, taking the beer keg away. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that guy in the party that goes, all right, party's over, guys. So, but it must be a huge <laughs> challenge to instill this kind of uh, the. It's almost like inst instilling the value of money again in the organization that every dollar counts and you need to be aware of that and just because yeah. we have it doesn't mean we can put it to poor use correct and it must this be goes, so hard for you it is and, the, and again this goes back to the pitfalls of actually having billions mm -hmm. right and like mm -hmm. what is that internal messaging and the reality is you can't take away the punch bowl right this company is founded on high growth you know like mm -hmm. very thoughtful innovation and you can't you can't come in and squash that. I mean, that's just not, that doesn't make sense. So, so it doesn't make sense. So one of the things that we talk a lot about within the, the finance team is that actually we are a service provider internally. And the systems that we're, that we're building, which is, you know, mostly kind of like SAP, profitability by product, profitability by function group, these are really going to be designed as tools to allow the business leaders to sit in a room and have an articulate discussion with one another about which product makes sense. Because you know, ultimately, they should be deciding you know, about what should be prioritized and what should be deprioritized. And they can only do that with information. Mm. So you know, frankly, that's really the goal. The goal is not to stand in the way of anything. The, the, I, the love, I love that analogy, the information. So if we go back to Andre's poker analogy, okay, the benefit of having a big stack is you can play a lot of hands. That's right. Which means that you can take exactly. a lot more risks. That's so you can right. keep playing to see what your what the next card will be, right? But your job in the organization is not to prevent that risk taking, but you see your job as the one who reminds the player what are the probability odds every time mm -hmm. before right. before the ROI. before C calling. Correct. We have the <laughs> we have the capital comes in yeah. and then essentially with with this group principally in consultation with Andre and the rest of the team Right, we essentially analyze that amount of capital, and then we allocate, and we <clears throat> measure, and we monitor, and then we adjust. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a constantly dynamic, changing environment, and, and, and frankly, that's what makes it so interesting. Yeah, and then you know, if, if you take a step back, you know, um, everyone also needs to remind themselves that raising money, it's it feels like you know, if the analogy is it's good for short term, it's bad for your health long term. Mm -hmm. If a company is founded on the belief that it will always continue to be uh, dependent on external, you know, capital, then you know obviously there's something wrong in that business, mm -hmm. right? So, and people tend to forget the essence of that, you know, that saying, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and this is where you know raising billion is definitely a curse because you're in that virtuous cycle where, oh, money is so easy to be raised. I can raise like a billion or two tomorrow. There's ample demand. People love us and stuff. And that continuation of not being disciplined, not being very, you know, uh, hungry on, you know, trusting your product and really building those metrics that relates to product is actually the pitfall, right? Because guess what? Next year, when capital, you know, if you are a subpar product executor, but you have a lot of capital, and next year the capital runs out, the better product team wins, hands down. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no um, kind of history in the world where the, you know, the worst product 
wins against the better product in the longer run in a profitable environment in a profitable environment mm-hmm. and that's why and you know companies in the US are trained this way because a lot of the competitive landscape is saturated the only thing that determine whether they can win or not is whether their product is good whether the customer loves the product and stuff and that's why it's it's you know the the ecosystem is developed in a in a much different way against you know the regions that are facing hyper competi- uh, uh, competitiveness right in like india southeast asia and stuff and that's actually how we actually need to grow up and mature but that's right and i think in the end you know having some sort of frugality in the process actually drives a much better outcome mm-hmm. right? because it makes people think about efficiency and impact mm-hmm. and you know if you just can, if you're just writing internal blank checks to everybody then there's no ability to weigh results yep so, and then it's it also comes with a lot of maturity right because i mean to be fair not a lot of people understand that concept right because a lot of people who joins in this hyper growth type of technology company born and grow up in that environment so you haven't seen what you haven't seen right so that in some sense you know they don't understand sometimes the long term analogy how to sustain how to build a sustainable business and stuff so that process of education is also very important in some sense uh, i like in a way we had a chat um two days ago financial prudency is very important in some sense that if our mission at gojek today is to help the little guys like it's our job to make sure that the business is self sustaining so that our mission to help the little guys continues, continues to be sustainable right yeah. because otherwise if the business relies on external capital we are putting the risk not to this company but for the people who depend on this platform to really get an income and that mission purpose and that responsibility needs to resonate in the organization to start and ensuring people thinks that way right so start with that and obviously then we have to educate we have to build a better control system processes roi analysis i like your right. analogy and then optimize in every corner to be able to achieve those um, you know pipe dreams uh, you know dreams yeah yeah i i i really love that like <clears throat> i don't know about other companies but in gojek you know the majority of people here at least the majority of good people in gojek are actually here for the purpose Yep. the mission they're not here to create you know you know uh, a multi billion dollar, dollar yeah. company is for for them most people here especially in the leadership of gojek i think are most obsessed about the impact that we can create but you lose the right to fulfill your mission if you get addicted to outside money yep. and you can't stand on your own two feet mm-hmm. profitability is what earns you the right to continue your social mission and this is this is a like exactly what you said i love the way you position that correct and, and to that point i mean if you guys if you think about prior to to you know my entry right we had basically james running the finance accounting team mm. amazing guy mm. right and we've single handedly single handedly yeah. and we've <laughs> essentially now augmented that with you know additional senior leadership principally benny who's doing all the financial control work mm. he's brought in like a cadre of ex citibank folks he was the ex he's the ex uh, financial controller city group for indonesia yeah uh, putting in place all the new systems that are essentially going to deliver that, you know, the measurement of the ROI product by product. And then we have David, right? So David is is the uh, next PwC tax partner, worked at Uber for a long time. He's now the CFO for, for International. And collectively, it's our job to politely bring that tension <laughs> and not and, and, and not to ostracize or, or, or be too obnoxious. And uh, but at and times you have to be. You, you know, you do. You have I mean, to if, show if it's egregious. Of yeah, course, you've like got it, to like it's, step it's up. It's important. Yeah, and you can't. You know, and you can't do. And I mean, particularly in my case, it's impossible to do this job without some emotion. Yeah. Right. It's just. It just kind of. I mean, particularly given the number of eyeballs on us and the the amounts of money, mm-hmm. and frankly, the expectation and the other. You know, and we can't forget the impact to kind of the base part of the Indonesian economy. Right, there's a big obligation or responsibility that comes with running this company, not only in a sustainable but long-term profitable manner. Yeah, we are we are systemically integrated into the Indonesian economy in the most, you know, uh, integral way. Mm-hmm. It's just like it, 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 we ha- like for us, it is a national mandate to succeed. 
right? Yep. It's like just the amount of jobs, like mm-hmm. you know, anywhere from two million drivers, two million people in the merchant sector that we support their primary income. It's crazy. Just thinking about that level of pressure is 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 why people want to work here, but it also adds a huge amount of pressure to ensure that we succeed. That's right. Right. Mm-hmm. And if we do our job right, those numbers should be substantially larger, you know, next two to three years. Yes. Let's, I, I, I like, I want to go back into what, what Andre was saying about being coddled with lots of money. Mm-hmm. You know, what's really interesting is that I talk to a lot of people uh, who have left Gojek um, and uh, are, are doing uh, startups and starting business elsewhere and, or joining organizations that are of smaller scale, etc. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were some of the most successful people uh, internally hmm. inside Gojek. But what they told me was that they became, they, they, they hit this realization once they left Gojek that, oh wait, so, you know, they, they, I guess they took for granted the amount that capital can push you towards your business objectives in a rapidly fast way, or the quality of team members you can get to make something a reality. So a lot of what I want to warn people who have been working in high growth, high capitalized companies or, or very big companies, tech companies, when you do go out, you need to go out with open eyes and never ever overvalue your own contribution versus you in the ecosystem that you grew up with. So for a lot of people, it's their first time, right? In these mm-hmm. big companies, they grew up in it. They grew up in it in their pretty much their whole professional career. So it means that that's all they know. And this is a very dangerous thing when you go out on your own and you have these massively high expectations of your own performance when it's not actually backed up by the, right. the stack. And the stack is not the technology stack, it's the team stack and it's the money stack mm-hmm. that will push markets towards where you wanna go. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just wanted to kind of, it's an interesting part. A lot of people feel disillusioned coming out and then they're kind of struggling because you know, they don't have that stack. Yeah. Um, but, you know, don't fear, struggle on, because it just takes a lot more time. Gojek didn't happen overnight. That's this was right. a 10 year company in the making. Nothing great can be achieved in under 10 years. Nothing. That yeah. hasn't changed from back in the day to today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This right. is this mythology of like, oh, yeah, I would become a millionaire in like six months or one year. And I'm like, no. Yeah. Like, no great thing can be achieved in under 10 years. We're now approaching our 10-year mark. And that's, I mean, great company that has built this uh, strategy, if you may, or framework. Um, whatever, again, whatever the uh, environment is, you can always fundraise. So that's, that probably will be the, one of the differentiator, right? Because, yes, money will be, you know, sometimes, you know, because of macro, money will be limited. But the great company will always be able to continue to tap into that opportunity, right? And that's actually how everyone needs to think about it. Mm. Again, in downturn and up, you know, um, up market, like you have to kind of maintain that discipline and really build that strategy to be able to um, withstand all the uh, curveballs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And then cascading that down to the team, to your point, Nadim, I think we need to reinstate the mentality that this is going to be a marathon. Yeah. Right. This does not end like with the next fundraise. I mean, we always joke as you were saying about like, oh, the next fundraise and we're done. Yeah. Um, not that it's another fundraise, but there are going to be multiple hurdles going forward. Yep. Uh, and, you know, the team really needs to be purpose built mostly from a mentality perspective to actually be able to like, carry the burden and do it every day and make sure that, you know, there's not immediate burnout. Um, and, and what I've seen in my short time here is actually there has been a kind of a natural evolution because as you go from D, Series D to Series E to Series F, you know, we've had some changes in the leadership team and those changes are normal because, you know, somebody who comes in in Series A, by the time we hit Series D or F, it's like they've kind of done their marathon and mm-hmm. it's time to hand off the baton to the next person and we need to work closely with, uh, with those team members to make sure the new ones coming in to make sure that they're that they're prepared for the journey because it's not easy. It's not easy, and you're exactly right. The kind of people who burn out really fast are the ones that 
are not running a marathon. Um, they are thinking from milestone to milestone only and thinking like, are they, once I hit this, this is the, the, the most dangerous phrase. Mm -hmm. Once I get that, I'll be happy. Yeah. Or once yeah. I get that, I'll be relaxed. Or once I get that, then I don't have to worry about that anymore. And that's really mm -hmm. not the right <clears throat> mindset. Once you've gone through enough peaks and troughs, you start building the pattern recognition that on the way up, you always have to plan for it to come down. Mm -hmm. People who just assume on the way up is another up, that's trouble, right? So on the way up, never assume that it's going to continue to go up. But on the way down, never assume that it's just going to continue going down as well. This is where people give up. That's right. This is where people make stupid mistakes on the way up. And then people give up too early on the way down. And you can take this not just on a company flow, but on a personal career flow of an individual, right? Yeah. Within your job in, in these highly volatile, high growth companies, you need to accept and embrace that volatility as just part of the journey. Otherwise, you shouldn't really, you won't survive. Yeah, because, you know, it's, 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 it's great to actually bring, it, bring those up because, I mean, we, we say this, um, but in reality, people struggle, right? Because the amount of burden, the amount of expectation, the amount of like, you know, bad news happening, it just, it just weighed on you. And then, you know, obviously that's, so that's why when, whenever we talk about this marathon, in reality, we're sprinting in a marathon. That's right. It's consistent sprinting in a marathon, right? Because yes, of course, you, have, you know, you can strategize, you know, you can, you know, they take a little bit of a, uh, breather and then you run again and stuff but in reality this is a sprint in the marathon as well and that's actually not easy and we all we all have to realize that as well and help each other and you know people outside people who are building great companies and stuff to to help you know you know those mental health yeah, yeah and, that, and that pressure I mean that particularly for the more senior folks in the organization you end up carrying a lot more of the burden Yep. And, and you can't share with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's a lonely existence a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, either, either you're used to it and you like it and you can deal with it or you, or, or you can't. And, you know, fortunately, what I see in our organization is that we have a lot of purpose-built people mm -hmm. who are actually up for the task. And that actually creates a, a tremendous sense of camaraderie. And look, the one thing I'll notice is, you know, purpose you know, as opposed to achievement based people. Cor correct. Right? Pur purpose as yeah. in as in I'm, I'm here for essentially the greater good. Yes. Right. Of, yes. of like doing something that's really that's important. Right. Yes. And, and one of the most interesting observations for me. So so just for those that may be listening, um, I actually joined through a sale of one of the payment companies um, along with Ryu and Aldi, who I think have already been on the mm -hmm. podcast. And uh, what I find so remarkable about that time period was, you know, it took us probably nine months mm -hmm. to negotiate and close all those deals. Could have been a lot faster, Andre. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, and, but, but what's remarkable is if you look at Kartuku, now Spots, Midtrans, and uh, Mapan, nobody has left. Mm. Every single senior leader is still in place Right. actually has completely bought into the vision that has been explained and articulated quite well by the leadership team. And Despite how turbulent that integration process those, was. Those things are terribly yeah, difficult. For everyone. Terribly that. difficult. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think that's really credit. I mean, that says, for me, that says as much about an organization as you can. I mean, so often those type of M&A deals go off the rails. And like nine months later... Yeah. People have taken whatever money they're gonna they're gonna get paid out, and they leave, and they're bitter. If you look around here, like everyone is actually super excited about where GoPay is, because all of those deals were essentially in, central to, to executing yeah. the GoPay yeah. strategy. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, we are on the verge of doing something truly remarkable with GoPay, mm -hmm. and I think it's credit to those. I mean, I'm, I stepped out of the leadership position of, of my of, of the company that I sold really quickly, and essentially handed it over to Ryu. He's done an amazing job. So yeah. really, that's that's one of those things where I'm I'm looking forward to see where we land in another six to nine months. There, it's that's gonna right. be good. That's awesome, <laughs> guys. We're out of time. Thank you so much for talking about raising billions. Um, <laughs> I would like to have you back here on the show if you're willing. 
uh, to discuss other interesting topics. Mm -hmm. But we'll see where we are then. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nadine. Cheers. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.